Professor Clements with you as we work our way through geometrical optics. This session dealing with dispersion and lenses and relates to the sections 5 and 6 of chapter 25 of the OpenStax College uh, physics book. So first, dispersion. So some examples of rainbows here. Dispersion is when light of different colors comes out at different angles from some uh, device. And in this chapter we'll consider a prism, a piece of glass, uh, etc., that uh, has different index refraction for different wavelengths of light. And our visible spectrum here, of course, uh, from violet to red, different wavelengths and different frequencies. It turns out that uh, glass or water or diamond refracts differently for different frequencies, different wavelengths. There are different interaction and the short wavelengths refract more. They have a higher index of refraction. So in a prism, if we have some instant light passing through, this would be the situation if we just had one color of light. Um, all the energy would follow the same ray. But if we have white light with different colors, you can see schematically here, the rays are refracted at different angles inside the prism and also outside the prism as they go into air, refract differently. And the short wavelength reflects, refracts the most and the red wavelength refracts the least. The colors are spread out, they're dispersed, we have dispersion. So can you answer this question? Why is violet light refracted through a greater angle than red light? And you probably should write down Snell's Law and realize that the violet index of refraction is greater than the red index of refraction. The violet light slows down more than the red light. So we have a situation where uh, this is the case. We have refraction at different angles. So a rainbow, and again, a photographer's shadow here. The uh, sun is behind the person looking at the rainbow. And the light has uh, encountered a water drop. And as it enters the water drop, again, for water, the index refraction is different for red versus violet and all the other colors. So there's some spreading of the colors here. The different colors bounce off the back of the raindrop. And then there's a second refraction at the uh, surface with the air again. And there's some other subtleties that we're not going to go into. Raindrops are not spheres, uh, but uh, that's the basic action. There's dispersion, different index of refraction for different wavelengths. So here's some drawings showing a couple of raindrops. You know, you're looking at the violet that's coming from raindrops that are lower versus the red, raindrops that are higher up. And then we have the sun behind the person. And if there are multiple uh, reflections inside the water drop, then we can get a double rainbow. Okay, on to lenses. So here we have a situation you may have experimented with. Sunlight enters a converging lens and the light is brought to a focus, concentrating the energy enough to burn paper or wood. Um, something you should be careful with. The little bit uh, misleading on the diagram here, the rays of the sun are actually parallel to each other. Of course the sun is very, very far away from the magnifying glass. So the rays are parallel to each other. And it turns out the energy is brought to a focus in a distance called the focal length. Each lens has a certain curvature to the glass that creates a certain focal length and uh, this is one way to determine the focal length of lenses. Let parallel light, such as sunlight that came from a long distance away, enter the lens and it will be brought to a focus at the focal point and that's the focal length if the rays are coming in parallel. Uh, for objects that are closer to the lens, there will be a focus position, but it will not be at the focal point. So only if we have parallel rays coming into the glass do we see the focal point. This shows more realistic a lens from the side view, light that's parallel to the optic axis. The optic axis passes through the lens. There's a center to the lens and then there's a focal point. We are not going to worry about the fact that the lenses are thick. 
we're going to use uh, a simplification that uh, the light does all its refracting just at a single line through the center of the lens. So you'll see that in some future uh, illustrations. We are not going to calculate refraction twice. Uh, we're going to use simple rules for studying how the rays come to be bent at a certain uh, location. Now a diverging lens, different than the converging lens, the, again, converging lens here, thick in the middle, narrow on the ends, but a diverging lens is thin in the middle and thicker on the ends, on the edges. If we have parallel light come into a diverging lens, that light leaves as if there was a light source at the focal point. So the energy comes in and diverges, spreads out, as opposed to the converging lens. And the light can go either direction, from left to right or right to left. Usually we'll put the object on the left and let the light uh, move off to the right side in our diagrams, but it can go either way. So here's parallel light coming in from the right. It focuses at the focal point, and the focal length, number in centimeters or meters, is that distance from the focal point to the center of the lens. Here's parallel light coming in from the right into diverging lens, and the light spreads out. Sometimes this could be called a positive lens, because it turns out when we do our calculations, we'll use a positive number for the focal length. This would be called a negative lens, because the number for f we put into the equations will be a negative value. A little animation here of wave fronts. These are not rays, but wave fronts. Again, the rays are perpendicular to the wave fronts. So we have uh, light from a great distance away. These are flat wave fronts. They're coming in. So where is the focal point? Yep, right here, where that energy is coming down to a point, would be the focal point. And the distance from that point to the center of the lens is the focal length. And again, this is a Wikipedia image. So, rules for ray tracing with a converging lens. And here we've, uh, using the simplification of a thin lens, don't worry about the thickness of a lens, but there are three rules that you should memorize. A ray that's parallel to the optic axis comes to the lens, to the center line, and then you draw a line through the focal point of the lens and continue that on for some distance. Rule number two, if we have a ray that leaves the object and heads through the center of the lens, there is no refraction. It goes straight on through, straight line. And rule number three, if we pass through the focal point first before arriving at the lens, the light leaves parallel to the optic axis. Again, this thick dark line from left to right, that's the optic axis. It's perpendicular to the surface area of the lens, passes through the center of the lens. So our rays cross and locate the image. Over here on the right side we have an image. It's a real image. There's an actual concentration of energy at this location. We have real images that are produced in cameras, so we can, uh, in the old days, expose film. Modern cameras, cameras uh, activate the uh, sensor that uh, changes light into an electrical signal. On your eye, it is true when you're looking at somebody, on your eye the image is upside down. And your brain is used to that. Your brain can uh, interpret that correctly and we see people right side up. Uh, there have been psychology experiments with putting a prism or some optical elements in front of the eye such that this is flipped upside down. In not a long time, people can uh, handle this. The brain can accommodate that change. And uh, temporarily, everything looks upside down, but then people can get along OK. So this is the, the action for a converging lens, the ray diagram. And we'll do calculations. Uh, it turns out if I, I use the formula 1 divided by the object distance, object distance is from the object to the center of the lens, 1 divided by object distance plus 1 divided by image distance, that would be from here to here, a bigger number in this example. 1 divided by object distance plus 1 divided by image distance is equal to 1 divided by the focal length number. Uh, we'll do calculations with that and show you how that uh, proceeds. Then the diverging lens, again parallel light coming in, it leaves the lens as if it came from the focal point. So these dotted lines 
There's not actual energy traveling on these dotted lines. The actual energy came in parallel and left on this diverging path. But it's as if, when we do a ray diagram, we'll draw it as if the light came from the focal point. So here's an example of flower. The light is coming in parallel. It leaves this lens as if it came from the focal point here, back here, F. A second ray traveling through the center of the lens goes straight through. And where these rays cross, if we have our eye back here, your brain will believe the image is located at this position where the ray, this ray, crosses the ray that went through the center. So we'll see a smaller image than the object. Um, and we'll do some examples with this. We use the same formula for calculations. 1 over object distance plus 1 over image distance equals 1 over focal length. The change will be that the focal length will be a negative number uh, for the diverging lens. Another example of this with a thin line here representing the lens. So our object, the light comes in parallel to the optic axis. This thick dark line is the optic axis. The light comes in parallel. It leaves as if it came from the focal point. A ray through the center of the lens goes straight through. Someone's eye is back here on the right side and that person believes they see the candle at this position where the ray crossed, um, the ray that goes straight through crosses the one that's extended backwards from this diverging ray. So this is our image position. And it's a virtual image. There's no actual energy concentrated here. Uh, these dark lines are where the energy is traveling and these lines spread out. There's no concentration of energy. It's a virtual image. Notice that it's upright where the real image previously was inverted. That happens for single lenses. Now a simple magnifier. Here again is a converging lens and we have an object that's relatively close to the lens. In fact, if you compare the focal length, it would be nice if there was a focal length dot over here. This object is inside the focal length of the lens. It's closer to the lens than the focal point. So we parallel light, passes through the focal point. Light through the center goes in a straight line and they're combining the two down here. Again, someone's eye back here will interpret the light as if it came from this virtual image. It's an upright image and it's bigger than the object. It's been magnified. So a converging lens can be used as a simple magnifier as long as the object is inside the focal point. It's closer to the lens than the focal length of the lens. A little diagram here again with the simple magnifier. A little bit cluttered, but there are lots of rays that come through the glass. Uh, but we end up with an image, a virtual image, that's larger than the uh, object. And that's our simple magnifier. So that's really where that covers the concepts, the principles. We can go one step beyond, we will, and do an example where we have two lenses acting together. Uh, so one lens will produce a first image and then a second lens will be brought in. I'm going to back up to uh, where we had our converging lens right here. So here's lens one, lens one is in place. And now suppose we put in another uh, converging lens right in here. So it's another converging lens. It should be a straight up and down line, but I can't draw it with the mouse. Um, what will happen to the image location if we have two converging lenses acting together? Well, the light as it comes through here will be more rapidly converged and we'll have an um, image someplace in here. We'll do examples of this in the calculations and ray tracing. The key concept is that the first lens forms an image. This image is treated as the object for the second lens. So here would be our object distance. From the calculations, you'll be able to get the image distance using the first lens. You will usually be given how far the lenses are separated. So how do we come up with this distance from the second lens to the first image? We've calculated this number, the distance from the image from the lens. We're told this number, the distance between the two lenses. 
and you're correct, we do a subtraction. So we take the first image distance minus the separation of the lenses. That gives us the distance between the first image and the second lens. And then you must be careful. There's a convention that the object is positive if it's on the left of our lens. This object, which is really the first image, but it's the object for the second lens, is on the right. So you must attach a negative sign on your own. You must use a negative object distance in the calculation. So we'll practice with those. I hope you keep on practicing. That's where we'll, uh, we'll end for today in our discussion of uh, dispersion and forming images with converging and diverging lenses.